Okay, very good morning. Wednesday, 30th of August. Hope you all had a good evening. Getting straight on with the, the briefing and looking at the charts this morning, uh, a moderate risk on tone, um, as will, you can probably see in the far corner there in my screenshot, Mr. Wave Will. He's, uh, he walked in saying, well, we're still here. We've, uh, World War Three hasn't quite begun as yet. And uh, US equities yesterday, last night, lo and behold, closed in positive territory. So obviously a very different context when we came into the marketplace yesterday morning. Complete risk off. Uh, gold at that point was on its way to a year-to-date high printed at just above uh, 1330. Uh, equities stock futures were lower uh, classic kind of flight to quality bid was seen across the board obviously it came with that uh, missile ballistic missile test fired from North Korea going over land mass of the northern island of Hokkaido in Japan and then landing the Pacific Ocean uh, but since that point there's been a couple of things obviously which um, major Western powers have commented yesterday so let's really just have a quick look at that and it will give us a bit of an indication then as to why we had positivity yesterday a lot of people were awaiting of course the US president given such provocation from North Korea and this kind of next level of missile testing giving where the path uh, of the projectile if you like was how would Trump respond and actually for the first time the, that I can remember in a while, it was a fairly measured response from the president uh, in that he just said that all options are on the table after North Korea missile launch. Um, in terms of the UN, they held a special meeting, the UN Security Council on Tuesday, an emergency meeting where they basically condemned North Korea's four recent missile launches, including the one that overflew Japan as outrageous. Uh, the council also demanded that North Korea comply with past UN resolutions and suspend its ballistic missile nuclear program. So the UN Security Council pretty much towing the line. No change in the in the communication there. Uh, and really it was more Trump. Um, he said the world has received North Korea's latest message loud and clear. This regime has signaled its contempt in a statement from Trump adding that Pyongyang's destabilizing behavior was increasing its isolation. Uh, so again, nothing like, I'm going to strike your country with fire and fury, which we heard only about several weeks ago. Uh, and it was that kind of language that really did spook the market at the time. Uh, and I think this more conciliatory tone that we've heard from the White House, as well as China, which is obviously a very important player in this equation, and then the UN Security Council was meant that, well, this isn't going to lead to military confrontation anywhere near the near term. And as such, the markets kind of um, faded the move, if you like, but in the opposite direction and that we've, we've taken back a lot of that flight to quality move that was seen across assets uh, in yesterday's session. So looking at the charts this morning, uh, stock futures, well, as I speak, the DAX session highs. Um, so we've pretty much taken back in the futures the centre-left chart, the entire downtick that was seen predominantly in the European Open yesterday. Uh, the S&P, if we look at that, well, first of all, let me tell you the close on Wall Street last night. The SPUs was up a fraction, 0.1, but the Nasdaq was up 0.4%. The Dow was up a quarter percent. So we've just continued that tone uh, fairly quiet overnight in Asia. And then if you're looking at the S&P futures here, uh, you can see just roughly around that double top from really defined the top end of the range from last week, the 22nd high uh, and the 25th high. So you can see here on my chart, putting, putting us back on the levels where really we were at going back towards the 17th of August. Um, so pretty decent recovery here being seen in the, in the equity markets. Gold. Having a quick look at that, obviously, as I just said, we had a, well, look, I've still got these, this chart marked up with the exact markings that I had for a, a talk that I'll be giving next week. So you can see here the kind of journey that gold's been on. The Jackson Hole Symposium, 
So then Janet Yellen, we were eagerly awaiting her commentary, although she didn't really say a great deal. It did add to a high degree of volatility, just given that a lot of the, the market was fairly quiet in terms of volume and liquidity, uh, given the time of year. Uh, but also as well with people waiting for that key speech. So it added a little bit of volatility. You can see that defined by the large wick uh, on that particular candlestick when she spoke. Uh, we then moved higher because she, uh, if anything, in terms of market pricing, uh, looking at where we are in this current point in time, pre her speaking, and granted there's been other things, there's obviously the Korean issue, although it's dissipated slightly, it's still looming. You then got the the fallout from Hurricane Harvey. You've also got the debt ceiling issue still looming large coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, so not surprising to see federal funds rate futures. Um, the, the probability of a 25 basis point rate hike from the Fed in December has fallen at around this point, pre-Yellen, from about 44, 45% to current about 30%. So as far as the market is concerned, we are not going to have an interest rate hike this year. And actually, we're only priced for one interest rate hike in 2018 in terms of the fixed income market. Uh, this, this is, as you well know, against what the Fed is communicating. So if the Fed, this is one important thing, if the Fed are to follow through with this commitment uh, of balance sheet tightening and a final rate hike probably in December, then they certainly need to start upping the ante in terms of the type of commentary that the FMC members are saying, i.e. they need to manage market expectations back up from 30 to in excess of 50% so that that deck hike is priced in. Now let's not forget that they can do that in a matter of weeks uh, with a lot of hawkish statements. We've seen that before various times throughout this year when they've managed to communicate in such a fashion that the rate hike is essentially 100% priced in. So therefore, it's then the summary of economic projections that defines the market direction. Um, so I don't think the Fed have to worry too much at this point. You know, we're not even in September quite yet, so they've still got a bit of time. But certainly things like the jobs data, particularly the average hourly earnings, that wage data will be very important when we get uh, non-farm payrolls on Friday to monitor, again, with that kind of chief concern over inflation. But just going back to this gold chart, so that was the Jackson Hole situation. Then you had the breach on 1300, always acts as a kind of a psychological barrier in either direction, um, but certainly on this side, on the upside, initially, you can see it in the aftermath of Yellen, we tested it. A couple times before then the eventual breach came the following morning. Um, then you've had the UK bank holiday. This is when uh, then following on from the gap up, the North Korean test, the fairly low conditions, saw a decent move post Yellen. Uh, and then we've got all the way up to well, what was the high print at actually 1331 spot nines. Uh, and now we've pulled back a little bit as we just mentioned predominantly that move came in the US evening. So after we had gone home, and again, it came as US equities continued to show uh, a fairly, fairly strong recovery from that initial weakness. As I just said, there's been a fairly conciliatory tone issued by most of the major powers against that development in North Korea. Now, just looking at this gold chart, what's interesting now is we're trading at 1313, I was just having a look at S1 this morning. So S1 sits around 1306, 1306 and a half. Uh, that's that level that I've got marked up here. But of course, that level is also the high on the 18th. So if you're of the belief still that, okay, yes, we can, some of that need for safe havens has dissipated slightly, but given a lot of these issues are still unresolved, that gold should remain supported, then 1306 looks like a quite a good level if you were thinking about reinitiating re the long position. Uh, so S1 and that 18th high in the futures, I've been told that the spot price, uh, that high on the 18th is exactly the $1,300 handle, which probably only validates that level even further. 
so if we do come down to that point, we're about uh, well, we're about a good eight bucks or so away from there at the moment. But I definitely would be uh, keen to see what the movement is like if we got to that point uh, for potential looking at the long again uh, as an entry. Okay, a few other things then going back to the news side of things. Although we've had a, a measured response from Trump, Kim Jong Un is not having any of it. He said the late, latest missile test was a prelude to containing Guam. Um, so although Trump said all options remain on the table, uh, the North Korean leader uh, has basically saying that the test firing missile over Japan was a meaningful prelude, uh, adding he'll continue to watch the response of the US before deciding on further action. Uh, I think today and tomorrow is the last day of the US South Korean uh, military exercises that have been going on for a period of what would be 10 days in total maybe when they they finish then it will mean that North Korea doesn't have to be so vocal uh, in such a manner so for the moment it seems that this situation is relatively contained but obviously there's a, a monumental tail risk if something were to go wrong um, so always worth being aware of it but for the time being this has uh, changed considerably in the last 24 hours in terms of how the market is reacting moving on the other big story of course is Hurricane Harvey uh, and in particular its impact uh, because actually Harvey is set to return and hit landmass again later today I'm going to have a look at that in a second in terms of the mapping so you can get an idea of what we're looking at uh, but what we have been seeing, and yesterday was an incredible session for oil, I think. It was so volatile. Um, just having a quick look at oil prices here. Uh, we had that big run lower during the, uh, really much of the yesterday's session. It then started to spike higher again. We recovered a decent dollar swing before then coming back lower. This was after we had a big decline over the bank holiday, UK bank holiday, that is. So... I think this, a lot of this is a bit of a byproduct of the transparency of information, or lack of, I should say, coming in from various different refining facilities, uh, and also oil platforms, oil and gas wells, all within the Gulf of Mexico. There's almost so many facilities that it's very difficult to get a real accurate gauge of what is the exact situation. Um, but in summary, the numbers that we have this morning is that about 20% of refining capacity has halted operations. Uh, the biggest US refinery is said to be shutting because of severe flooding at the moment. So gasoline has risen for a seventh session while crude continues to remain somewhat under pressure. Um, so it's motor fuels in particular that, are, that have seen some of the biggest surge. So essentially this divergence between the two products being that um, there's a lack of demand for crude because of the impact that the flooding has had on the refiners which are situated along the coastal line uh, of the Gulf Coast, so the Texan state. Motor fuel prices though have surged uh, because of uh, this lack of refinery action and so gasoline has continued to power higher uh, and fueling further divergence in the spread over oil or further widening, I should say. Uh, but this is what a lot of people are looking at at the moment, is we're bracing for a second round. So what this graphic is showing you here is that Harvey is expected to make landfall again on the Texas-Louisiana border today. So this is where it is at the moment. It kind of hit inland, came offshore, and now it's gone back and heading in terms of the path. And obviously you've probably heard of Port Arthur before, that's one of the biggest facilities there is within this particular region. Looking at this on a slightly scaled out perspective, this is the type of um, path that we're looking at and projection over the next coming days. And you can see really how Harvey's impact, I mean I was reading some of the statistics this morning, yesterday or this time when I was delivering the briefing there's estimates that the impact for the insurers might be around $20 billion. Numbers I've read this morning are in excess of double that at the moment. 
uh, over 40 billion. Um, this fact that this is coming back in land, you can see here, not only is it going to go back through kind of the San Antonio area, it's then through Thursday, Friday, it's going to start heading essentially all the way up into the northeast area of the United States before then it starts to dissipate. Uh, so certainly not heard the end of this uh, at this point in time. This was a, an interesting graphic. Uh, I'll post this in to the chat room after I finish the briefing. And the reason why I wanted to share this with you is that yesterday I got a lot of questions from people about, you know, there was uh, the Kinder Morgan refinery, there was ExxonMobil's Buermont refinery, ExxonMobil's Baytown Port Arthur for Total, Motiva for Port Arthur, you know, all these different names that some of you may not have heard of before. Uh, and what I've managed to obtain here is a really good infographic that looks at the Texan coast product supply impacted by Harvey and looks at all of the individual sites and importantly with the type of production, i.e. barrels per day, that each um, facility uh, capacity is. So it'll give you a better idea then. So if you look at the table in the bottom right hand corner, so Baytown Exxon Mobil has capacity of 560,000. Buremont also Exxon around 362,000. So they're by far the largest. Whereas uh, Buckeye Corpus Christi, for example, is much smaller at 50,000. So it will help you put into a bit of context the type of news that you're hearing, uh, the analysts covering or the news that you're seeing on Bloomberg and Reuters and, and so on. Um, so definitely worth having this as, as kind of a crib sheet, I guess, to make sense a little bit of the noise that you hear uh, in terms of the news flow. Uh, on this point, talking of oil, let's have a quick look at the oil infantry data that came out last night. As per usual, let's have a look at the price of oil and how it moved when this data set came out. So if we just go back to half nine, let me just highlight the specific candlestick here when the data came out, which was that one there. You can see there's a little quick spike on the upside before then coming back. And really, the API crude oil inventories that's happened last night have had absolutely no lasting impact. And I would completely expect that to be the case because who cares about the infantries now that we've had a hurricane, one of the biggest in many years, hit probably the most important area in the United States, i.e. the Gulf of Mexico. So I would imagine that any reaction to the Department of Energy's crude oil infantries this afternoon will be very short-lived because people already are looking forward and now starting to price oil on the ramification, on the impact of Hurricane Harvey. And so last week's infantry situation is now redundant as far as the market will be concerned. And I think that's really validated that view as a consensus by the fact that really this oil price is exactly where it was when the APIs came out, despite the initial kind of volatility. Nonetheless, just so you're aware, the numbers for those crude inventories, we had a drawdown quite a bit larger than expected, 5.78 million. Expectations were for one and three quarters. Cushing was a build of 582,000, slightly larger build. Gasoline was a build, which was a slight surprise, of just shy of half a million distillates, a draw of around half a million. Uh, but again, I wouldn't be looking for the DOEs to have the classical type of reaction that you're probably used to on a week-to-week -week basis because oil traders have bigger things on their mind, uh, i.e. navigating for expectations around this uh, situation with Hurricane Harvey. Actually, I've just seen a tweet come down. Let me just have a quick look, see if there's anything relevant for this discussion we've just been talking about. This is uh, AFP uh, because it's not just about the hurricane hitting, it's also important about the flooding situation. Uh, you can see here, really, it's really devastating what's happened in, in Houston. I'm sure you've seen the photos. Uh, but you can see here the path, actually, on this chart quite nicely of where um, Harvey has gone inland towards the Colorado River and San Antonio, come back out, and it's gone along the coastal up. You can see here, remember, it was the offshore facilities that are really based around 
uh, towards moving uh, east along the coastal line towards Beaumont and then it, this storm, tropical storm now, it has been downgraded, is going to move on through Louisiana and Mississippi going forward. Okay, a few other topics just to quickly discuss with you. Um, first off, one is the Euro and really this story about Mario Draghi. Uh, this was something I sent out to you guys as an article from Bloomberg this morning. Draghi seen putting a lid on the Euro as traders test the pain threshold. You know, a lot of people anticipating uh, in Draghi's speech at Jackson Hole late on Friday that he potentially could have made a comment such as uh, the Euro's at important or significant levels, i.e. he's getting concerned about the appreciation of the currency and the impact that they might ha that might have on the European economy, uh, especially when you talk about export-type nations such as Germany and so on, uh, and also with this fairly uh, benign situation with inflation overall in the Eurozone area. Um, but we didn't hear anything from Draghi. And so, if anything, that just helped propel the pair higher, given the fact that we heard silence as well from Janet Yellen. So, a little bit of policy divergence almost between people questioning the Fed's validity in their strategy to tighten policy into year end against the ECB, who seem uh, on path, at least for the time being, if Draghi's not stressing over the strength of the euro. Uh, to commence giving further hints towards their tightening strategy. Um, so this was quite an interesting article. Have a read if you get the chance. Um, having seen the euro break psychologically, the 120 handle, though, for the first time since January of 2015 yesterday, um, may see some profit taking in the near term, but banks have no doubt its trajectory remains bullish going forward, triggering an unwelcome tightening of financial conditions in the euro region. Uh, so this is basically lots of different banks who are commenting all about the euro currency. Sticking with the ECB and its strategy of tightening, one thing uh, that I was looking at this morning which I found quite incredible is bunds. Now I'm looking at this chart here because what I wanted to show you was, and this was something similar to what Safe probably showed you at the end of last week, but if you go back to the 27th of June, you guys can remember the 27th of June and the days that followed after that. One of the biggest, it was a, a catalyst for one of the biggest kind of week or two week moves that we've seen in global yields in many years. This was of course the ECB forum that was held in Centra, Portugal, when we had what looked like at the time a coordinated move um, from the global heads of central bank probably the one exception being Japan, that they were turning hawkish as a collective. This saw a massive move higher in European yields and consequently then the Bund was under immense pressure. We got all the way down in the Bund future, beginning of July, down to 160.31. And here we are, five points we've bounced since that point in time. Huge move. If you actually look at it, where we were pre-centra speech i.e. hawkish central banks globally we are right back at that point 165 handle so it's just quite interesting to see that that move has failed to be sustained but the euro currency has continued to remain fairly well bid so fixed income uh, maybe not quite as convinced as the fx market has been uh, here in more more recent times okay few other things to look at on the calendar and just quickly to update you you've had a couple of the German state CPIs this morning remember if I've probably given you the data lecture for some of the interns you'll know that really the first couple of states that report will give you a pretty good insight as to what the the pan-german reading will get at 1 p.m. will be which then by that time is a non-event because it's just the summary of its parts so what we can tell so far um, looks like the German state of Saxony was out early this morning. That was the first one. Uh, year on year, 1.9% up from a previous 1.7. Um, looks like we've had Brandenburg just come in the last two minutes. 
Uh, I'm just seeing if the, the numbers come out. It doesn't look like my feed's populated correctly, but I can see it on Twitter. It came in at 1.8 against previous 1.4%. So some actually pretty decent year-on-year -year figures showing improvement on the previous month for the German CPIs. And so uh, potentially here a little bit of movement to be mindful of in the euro buns that look a little bit more short dated it's not having too much of reaction uh, but this is all something which the uh, the ecb will welcome the inflation is actually picking up and remaining at an around target uh, going forward we'll get the rest of the german states as we go through the morning we then get some um, credit data mortgage lending and approvals coming up at 9 30. Uh, if you remember reading any of the press over the last couple of days, we continue to get house price data in the UK showing that essentially we're flatlining, if anything, house price um, through lack of demand given the issue on savings rates uh, and people's kind of lack of clarity over the Brexit situation, which is impeding their confidence for the outlook going forward. Um, wouldn't be surprising to see uh, over the coming months things like mortgage approval start to just tail off slightly. Um, otherwise, going for further forward, you get a cluster of European data at 10 o'clock, and this is monthly data. And although it looks exciting, economic sentiment, services, industrial sentiment, consumer confidence, all for the euro area, actually, this very rarely does it have a, a market impact. So I'd keep an ear out for it, but I wouldn't be looking for it to act as a, uh, a definitive factor to shape the rest of the morning. Uh, really then, going into the afternoon, as I said, the German, the actual pan-German readings are a non-event by the time they come out because we would have already seen all of the individual states. Um, we then get probably the most important piece of economic data today is at 1.15. So for any of the interns who are newer to trading the intraday markets, don't get caught out by a, a slightly unusual time for a piece of data coming out. So that's quarter past one, one fifteen. Now ADP, let's have a quick look, is often seen as a bit of a precursor for the um, jobs data we get from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on a Friday, non-farm payrolls. This is the private payroll figure. You can see last time it came in at 178,000. So it has been on a slight decreasing trend, as you can see over the last three months. Uh, and actually, the last figure was just a touch below expectations. Uh, so again, just to formulate a kind of market expectation around that headline change in non-farm payrolls, the market will be looking at this quite closely. Uh, another word of warning as well with ADP for anyone new is do not get caught out by jumping into the market in quick fashion on just the headline figure itself. Uh, typically with ADP, it takes anything from around one to five seconds for the revision to become available. And more often than not, what happens is the actual figure comes in, let's say hypothetically above expectations, but then the revision is downward or vice versa. Obviously what you're looking out for for a more cleaner trade opportunity if it was on the data itself would be a number which far out or underperforms and then with the revision in the same direction i.e to give it a further push in sentiment i.e positive or negative uh, but don't get caught out by the revision it's always very important for adp after that uh, you've got the second reading of us gdp actually today so for q2 we're only expecting very marginal revisions here um, so 2.7 from 2.6. Uh, also looking out for the core PCE data, which will be important. Uh, and then we've got the Department of Energy oil inventory numbers, which will come out usual time at 3.30. And finally, a speaker this afternoon, just ahead of the cash open on Wall Street, Fed's Powell, who is a voter, uh, speaks on key areas of focus on a supervisory forum. So that's at 2.15 again. Okay, that's pretty much it. Just to uh, wrap things up, I've just seen, uh, while I've been talking, a couple of headlines come down for Libya. So just so you're aware, Libya's NOC, so their state-run um, oil company, says 360,000 
barrels per day of crew production shut down by pipeline blockades that have closed three fields. Uh, and so although we've had downside pressures due to um, subtraction on the demand side of the equation, if you like, from Hurricane Harvey for, on WTI crude, maybe mitigated slightly by the fact that this more bullish situation where uh, a fairly large amount of production is being shut down via pipeline blockades closing three of the main fields in Libya at the moment. So to just be aware of. Okay, guys, any questions, as per usual, feel free to, to reach me in the chat room. Otherwise, have a good day. Thank you very much.